Mr. Rummel. Hopefully there will be. So this is your chance now. First of all, I again would like to acknowledge the supporters of our program today. Without uh, the support of the pharma industry, this program could not happen. And uh, uh, a special thanks to Teva uh, Pharmaceuticals. Really, they're uh, our presenting uh, donor. They are helping us stream this throughout. And um, we'd also like to sell, uh, thank Celgene and BioVest. And uh, please look at all of the people who are sponsoring this. Every single one of them has made the program um, able to do this today. And uh, Liz McMillan from Hope for Lymphoma and, and Scott, we really thank you again very much. Um, I would like to introduce Dr. Vinu Gopal, who is my associate at Rush University. He's actually associate director of the entire division of hematology, oncology, and cell therapy, and director of the section of hematology. Uh, he's a co-director with me of the lymphoma program and sees many, many patients with lymphoma. So Vinu, welcome, and thank you for being with us today. And, and Dr. Stephen Schuster, who comes from my area of the country, I'm originally from South Jersey, and Steve is uh, from the University of Pennsylvania. He's chief of the lymphoma program. Uh, he has done extensive work in lymphoma, and you'll hear um, him speak later on some of our newer agents that are available that may lead to a cure of uh, lymphoma. So Steve, welcome to you also. So this is an open panel discussion of the things that you heard this morning, and I would really like our, our patients to put together some questions and come up and ask. There is no question that is a dumb question. There is no question that's inappropriate. Uh, we just cannot address your particular aspect of your disease or your um, family's disease. But please come up to the uh, microphone if you have any questions. Um, we're going to start. Yes, we have one question right off the bat. And if you wanted to address it to one of our panelists or say anyone can answer it, and if one person answers it, we'll probably ask the others also for input. Well, this is just for the group. I had uh, the CHOP treatment plus rituximab. I'd like to know what are the side effects that I might expect having the CHOP treatment. And when did you receive that? In 1998. That's right. And have you relapsed since that time? Yes. Uh, local, then, locally, I believe, pretty yes. locally, and you received four weeks of rituximab? Yes. And no other treatment than for two years now? Uh, for seven years. Seven years after the rituxan, right. So a relatively long history, uh, initially treated elsewhere with an arch. Do you know if you were symptomatic or you had high tumor burden at the time of diagnosis? Uh, no, I think I was asymptomatic. I did have uh, two lymph nodes that were enlarged, one in my neck, one in my groin. They were both removed and I was told I had cancer. So you were at least a stage three because you had disease above and below the diaphragm. Do you know if your bone marrow was negative? Negative, yes. It was negative. So you were a stage three asymptomatic patient treated with our CHOP. And I think you were offered a clinical trial at another institution. Yes, with Dr. Fisher at uh, Loyola University. So are, are there side effects that I can expect down the road from CHOP? And I'd also like to ask, there's been some discussion about, um, I've had about, oh, about a million uh, CAT scans. Uh, okay, I'm going to let, I'm going to ask Dr. Vinu to start uh, perhaps addressing that, and then I'm going to get the input from all of our panel discussants. Okay, so the question is, <clears throat> what are the side effects of CHOP chemotherapy or CHOP rotoxin chemotherapy? So when we talk about side effects, as you know, if you look at the list of side effects that is mentioned in any of the package insert. You will have, again, just like what you told about CAT scan, a million side effects may be mentioned. I think the most important thing is to ask your doctor, what are the common side effects I should be aware of and uh, I should be uh, taking care of in terms of uh, preventing them. So the commonest side effects, I would say, with CHOP and rituxan would be the potential that uh, because of the low counts, you may develop infections. So you know, the second week after CHOP chemotherapy, your white cell count may be low. And at that time, if you develop a fever, you have to take it seriously because you may need intravenous antibiotics because your immune system is low. So that is one thing I would uh, uh, be very uh, careful about. The second set of side effects, you know, uh, the adriamycin is one of the drugs in CHOP that has effects on the uh, heart. 
uh, cardiac side effects. Again, that doesn't usually happen in patients with a normal heart function to start with. That's why they always check cardiac function before you start CHOP chemotherapy. But if you accumulate over a period of time a particular dose, beyond that, the cardiac side effects can be significant. So that's one thing I would remember. Then there is a drug called Vincristin, which typically can cause uh, peripheral neuropathy, which is affecting the small nerves in the tips of the fingers and toes. You may feel funny sensations, something called paresthesia, so funny sensations, pins and needle. So those are very common side effects. Prednisone is part of the CHOP chemotherapy. As you know, prednisone is a steroid. It can cause side effect, but we usually give it for five days only, and it is repeated every three weeks. So it doesn't usually cause the side effects like high blood pressure, high blood sugar, which are associated with steroid use. Uh, those are, I think, I would say the more common side effects you should be aware of. And rituximab, again, when the rituximab is given through the vein, you can get allergic symptoms in the beginning. That's very common. And if it happens, it is usually in the first one or two hours of the first dose. You may have some rashes or fever, sometimes chills, and very rarely serious side effects like dropping blood pressure or oxygenation. But that is very rare, particularly because we do give medicines to prevent such reactions before we start the infusion. So Dr. Vino has given you the, sh the short-term side effects, the ones that occur during the, the rituxin and the CHOP. Um, what are the long-term complications? Five, 10, 15 years, Steve, after CHOP rituxin. And I think this is why this is a group of patients today that we have to tell you not to be over-treated because every time you get a combination of drugs, and one of the drugs in the CHOP regimen is called cyclophosphamide doc, cytoxin. Dr. Rummel talked about that. That is an alkylating agent. And there are long-term side effects that can occur from any chemotherapy drug if patients are then treated again with either the same drug or get similar drugs of the same class or down the road. So perhaps, Steve, you could address maybe long-term side effects of the CHOP rituxin regimen. And then, Dr. Call, I'm going to ask you to address the CT question. Well, as far as chemotherapy regimens go, the CHOP regimen is uh, uh, rather well tolerated and the acute side effects were just described. Um, the long-term side effects uh, are uh, uh, in terms of frequency, uh, rather rather rare. So, in, in women who are premenopausal, chemotherapy with alkylating agents may uh, shorten the time uh, uh, of um, menopause. Uh, the, yeah, the the the, the or sh reduce the amount of time to to uh, uh, reach menopause. So there's some depletion. Uh, um, of eggs, some reduction in fertility, but I mean, if somebody is going to go through menopause at age 50, uh, you may be talking uh, at age 48 instead. So it's, it's a small risk, and in terms of men, there, there is a, a, a very transient reduction in fertility during chemotherapy, but not uh, long term. I think the, the late complication that's the, of most concern with alkylating agents um, is the development of second leukemia or blood cancers from uh, the alkylating agents themselves. Most of the time that happens within about two to five years. So you're far out from that. Um, and I think the risk is, is rather low. So these side effects are, are uh, not, uh, I think, of tremendous concern when one weighs the potential risk uh, benefit equation uh, for this regimen. Uh, and the diseases for which it's and used. And the concern does come in if your disease came back, say, after an R-CHOP regimen within a year or two years, and you needed another regimen right away. Or you needed, and we haven't even talked about this, but we will, um, a novel approach, which is called radioimmunotherapy, which is uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, an underused modality. I'm going to move on to ask Brad about the number of CTs. All of my patients are concerned about this. And I am trying to cut down on the CAT scans done in our low-grade lymphoma patients. But if you're in a clinical trial, the only way you can sometimes evaluate patients on a clinical trial is to even get CAT scans every three months. And in the resort trial that Brad had, those patients were every six months, I, I believe. Uh, and then I do have one final question, uh, comment from Dr. Rummel. So this 
this question about CT scan frequency is a very uh, active question. And I would be very interested to hear from the rest of the panel on this. Uh, we probably do too many CAT scans, and I'm guilty of it as anybody. Um, I definitely have cut back on the number of CAT scans in my practice in the last several years. Um, there's definitely radiation exposure with every CAT scan. What is the magnitude of the risk ex for the patient exposure with each CAT scan? I've never received a good answer from anybody on that question. How much risk are you really being exposed to with each CAT scan? Quantify that for me somehow. I can't find anybody who can give me an answer on that. Very controversial. Um, so, you know, think of it in two extremes. Um, <laughs> You could scan someone every month and you will be right on top of their disease, right? But that's clearly excessive. You could never scan someone after you've established remission and just kind of wait for symptoms to reappear. That would be another extreme. I don't like that personally. I know there are some people who actually do that, who feel that's reasonable and the right thing to do. Um, I inherited a patient a few years ago who was followed by a different doctor in town who never does CAT scans once their patients are in remission. I saw it was my first visit. I'm like, when's the last time you had a scan? Well, it was like five years ago. And his treatment had finished like five and a half years ago. I'm like, well, maybe we should take a look. <laughs> <laughs> and um, <clears throat> he's like, okay. So we did a scan. He had a massive amount of disease in there. Um, but, you know, he was asymptomatic. So uh, did I benefit him by finding that? Presumably, but he still felt okay. So I think you can take it too far in the other direction, too, personally. So like Mom said, everything in moderation, right? There's got to be some reasonable amount in there somewhere. In my own practice, if I take someone through a therapy, um, what, what I'm most interested in finding are the early relapses. If somebody come, if their disease comes back within six months or a year or a year and a half after they finish a treatment, their disease is telling you something and it's saying, I'm more stubborn. And then you might need to change the way you think about it. So those are the ones you're most interested in finding. So I will do scans every six months for the first two years after I finish a treatment. And then I try to taper the schedule after that to maybe like once a year. And then once I get out to around, if I have a patient who's been in remission for like five years, then I might say, well, let's try it every other year for a, for a while. And I've only been doing this for 12 years, so I don't know what you do after that. But I'll tell you what you do when you've been doing this for 40 years. <laughs> Very similar. I, I mean, if my patients are asymptomatic and they uh, not, have not been on treatment, I would probably try to once a year do a, a CAT scan. I did want to ask Dr. Rummel, because he had a large number of patients in his uh, bendamustine rituxin versus the R-CHOP treatment up front, and he has published, it's early data, um, but he does have the number of secondary malignancies that have occurred in the bendamustine rituxin group and in the CHOP rituxin group. So maybe you could address that. We're worried about second cancers by overtreating patients that we hope, like you, will have a chronic disease and will live for years. Yes, so um, I want to um, answer that question with two issues. The first, I want to add a comment to the discussion Brett Carl has just introduced to you. So I also follow my low-grade lymphoma patients for 10, 15 years. One lady absolutely enforced me to do a CT scan every six months for more than 10 years. She will not live in a good way if she does not do that control. In the end, after 12 years, she developed a chronic myelid leukemia. I was very bad feeling because I was thinking maybe I should have stopped all these CT scans. But on the other hand, I was thinking there is no evidence that the CML happened because of the CT scans. Simply, so that was a second leukemia, chronic myelogenous leukemia. Uh, simply, I have to say, I don't know what to tell somebody he is asking that question. On the other side, I had a very well um, a good gentleman in a good shape, 70 years, we did all the CT scans and I found a small, a non-small <laughs> cell lung cancer 
in a very early stage just by routine CT scan for lymphoma. He was operated and he survived it for more than five years. So that also gives me the feeling maybe I should CT scans do more often, but also I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a very complicated issue. Unfortunately, we don't have any trials for that. And as a consequence of the um, chemotherapy, we know that this may induce a secondary malignancy. So that is very important to look for. However, you have to observe these patients for 10 years. So the observation period of my trial is four years. And so far, there is, is exactly the same numbers of secondary malignancies after CHOP or after bendamustin. And this is both a little bit increased compared to the healthy population. So the risk of getting another cancer is higher than in the normal population. And that is probably due to the side effects of the chemotherapy or maybe due to the fact that you already had a malignant disease in your body. And so the difference between the both treatment arms is there's no difference so far. Thank you. Uh, thank you. A yeah. comment about the CAT scans as well. I, um, the, I, I think that what, what should be done and is not being done is that our medical system should track patients by social security number or something and look at the cumulative <coughs> amount of radiation exposure someone gets in their over their life uh, by repeated imaging. Then we might be able to understand what, in fact, the risks are. It's not being done. There's no reason why it couldn't be done um, in this country. It's a cumulative exposure that, uh, that really concerns me. It's, your body doesn't forget that it's seen radiation, and every successive exposure adds to the, pre the exposure you've had before. The idea of risk comes from ob observations made by the Atomic Bomb Casualty Commission uh, uh, in survivors of the uh, Hiroshima uh, um, atomic bomb. And the, there are increased cancers that occurred in, patient, er, in, in, in uh, uh, people that were exposed to the amounts of radiation that we are exposing patients to with cumulative CAT scans. It's a small risk but it's a real risk, and the amount of that risk depends on the age of exposure. So people exposed to these levels of radiation prior to the age of 20 have, a, have actually a much more impressive risk than patients who are exposed uh, uh, at an older age, probably because the older people don't Thank live you. as long as the younger. I think we should maybe um, move to the next question. You know, we're live streaming, and I have a question from Colorado that I'm gonna try to read because it's really fine print here. Um, it's a two-part question. How long does rituxan stay in the body and continue to work after an infusion? And number two, does, is there any evidence that using rituxan earlier decreases the chance for transformation or of the disease over time? Brad, can you address that question and maybe repeat the question again? So the, the question was, um, the first question was how long does rituximab stay in the body? Uh, the half-life is about three weeks. Um, if you get, if you do four weekly doses in somebody, um, at if you measure it at three months after the last dose, about half the people you can't detect the drug anymore, and about half you can find very small levels. And by the time you get out six months, it's pretty much gone from everybody. Uh, so it hangs around a while. Uh, the second question: Transform oh, transformation and transformation. There's no evidence to date that early use of rituximab reduces the risk of transformation. Obviously, we have some studies now, that study from the UK that I showed and the resort study that I showed, where we hope to be able to track that over time, and we're trying very hard and very carefully to collect that information to see if it does change that risk. Thank you. Yes. In terms of your long-term side effects, is there any connection to trigger fingers, that sort of thing? Uh, from RCVP. <laughs> Anybody want to try to address that? I don't know of any association. Uh, a, a, tra a cramp in the finger where it doesn't go open again. Yeah, I don't know of any association. You know, we're learning more about uh, antibiotics today and uh, ruptured Achilles tendons and things like that, but I don't know anything about uh, um, th that as a side effect. So none of you have had patients who've developed that after chemo? No. Thank you. 
Thank you. I, I want to remind uh, the audience that the panel discussion uh, is supposed to be about watch and wait versus rituxan early treatment, but if you have other questions, we're certainly open to whatever you'd like to ask. My question doesn't address that. That's it, all right. Okay. Um, um, I have many allergies to medications as well as sensitivities. Um, is for rituximab and the um, benamustine both, um, I'm confused also about side effects. What's the side effects? What, what is uh, toxicity? What's an allergic reaction? But also, um, is there a way to know before taking any of these treatments, knowing my allergies and sensitivities, that I may react negatively to them, or someone may, whoever else may have allergies. I carry an EpiPen, so I'm very allergic to a lot of things. Binu, do you want to try that? And then maybe Dr. Romo has a comment. We certainly have seen patients who cannot tolerate rituxan. They've had reactions to that. We will often uh, send them to allergy, but maybe Dr. Binu can uh, expound on that. Yeah, I mean, exactly the same as Dr. Gregory said. Rituximab, as I mentioned before, uh, causes allergic symptoms. Most of them are very mild. Once in a while, you may see serious reactions uh, leading on to low blood pressure and even need for resuscitation, things like that. That can be very serious. And I don't think there is anything in the previous history that may really hint that this patient is going to develop a serious reaction. It's very difficult to predict that upfront. Uh, we initially thought it is mostly the mouse component in the rituximab. As you know, rituximab has a human protein component and a mouse protein component. And we thought it may be the mouse protein that is causing most of the allergic reactions. But as you know, later we, they came up with rituximab-like antibodies which are fully human protein and they have similar reactions too. I don't think it is just the mouse protein. So to answer your question, yeah, I mean it is known to have allergy and uh, it's very difficult to predict up front which patient would develop that. And regarding bendamustine reaction, I think Dr. Ramal may be the best person to answer about allergy to bendamustine. Yes, Thank so you. that is very interesting when you read the FDA um, characteristics as well as in Germany, as well as in clinical study protocols, they clearly say don't use that product if you are allergic to it. But you don't know until you have done it. So it's a very funny comment, but it's everywhere written. So to answer your question, we cannot foresee. You have to test it. If you are at an allergic disposition, one would treat you very slowly with the first rituximab to see if you're going to react and to immediately stop it. So we do that as a consequence for a patient with allergic disposition very slowly and a very small amount of rituximab as a testing dose. But you don't see, uh, but you cannot foresee it if or if not. And with bendamustine it's the same. Some patients experience besides a well-known side effect which is hematotoxicity. Some patients have some skin reaction as a side effect but you don't know who is going to have this. So you have to treat them and you have pe carefully look for the side effects and then you have to react if that is going to occur. Avinu has comment. As Dr. Ramal said, most of the time, the serious reactions appear when you start increasing the rate of infusion. As you know, rituximab, you start the infusion at a very slow rate and then keep going as the patient tolerates it. So even in patients with a very serious reaction, if you feel that the patient really needs it, this is a very important drug, we may be able to desensitize. There's a protocol we follow with the allergy and immunology colleagues. We can desensitize. We usually admit the patient to the hospital, sometimes into the intensive care, depending on the seriousness of the reaction, and desensitize them. I have time for two more Thank questions. You. Thank you. Uh, yes, I've had... Um, uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma for a number of years, 16 in fact. But in the beginning, um, I was just getting CAT scans, and now I get uh, PET scans, but I believe the PET scans are combined with CAT scans. Is there less uh, radiation from uh, the PET scans, or what's the advisability of the PET scans versus the CAT scans? 
First of all, I'd like to make a comment that there are certain criteria for when a PET scan really is recommended, and <clears throat> the criteria has always been in those tumors that are cur curative. So diffuse large B cell and Hodgkin lymphoma, you always want to have a PET scan at the end of treatment to make sure it's negative because these are curable diseases. There is less data in the indolent non-curative cancers that PET scans are helpful. There is a little bit of data from one of the recent trials, the PRIMA trial, that a PET negative at the end of treatment may keep you in remission longer. But I, 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 then I'll let our uh, panel address that briefly. But everybody does PET CTs in follicular lymphoma, and I don't. I do CAT scans. And if I suspect that there may be a transformation, I may do a PET scan because a transformation is a, a bit large cell, and that's when you may have uptake and you may know what to biopsy. But I, I'd like to have the group comment that. There are too many PET CAT scans done. The, the um, CAT scan that's done as part of the combination PET CAT scanning uh, imaging procedure is a low dose CT. So the dose of radiation is less. If you sum the radiation from the FDG, and the low-dose CAT scan, there's actually about 30% less radiation exposure in a PET CT scan than in a diagnostic <laughs> CT scan. The, the, the problem, and I guess the good or the bad thing, depending on which side of the coin you're looking at, is the diagnostic CTs are, are, give us fabulously detailed images of the inside of the body, but the price for those images is a really uh, a significantly high radiation dose, higher radiation dose. Probably Dr. for what we do for a living, a low-dose CT is probably good enough. Dr. Romo, I see you shaking yes, your head. Yes, uh, because I just had an international meeting with that question, and I re uh, listened to an excellent presentation from an expert of Hong Kong. He analyzed exactly what it's the PET CT for, and he told us in his whole presentation that from the clinical perspective, there is no role for PET CT, and in the end, he made a very surprising conclusion for me that everybody should use PET CT. I was wondering, and I was doubting that I'm hearing <laughs> right. And then his argument was because that is new and modern, and everybody wants to see a color TV instead of a black and white TV. <laughs> and if that is only the reason, that is very questionable. So I just to tell you how ambivalent that situation can be discussed. Yeah, our problem is that we get referrals in, and everyone I should mention with a cancer should get a second opinion at an academic center. If you have not done that, you should do that. Um, but we get uh, all of the patients referred into us from the community, they don't have CAT scans, they have PET CT scans. And it does make it difficult for us at times. Uh, another comment, Brad, to end this? Or no, about this. Well, um, for surveillance, we're talking about surveillance. You're monitoring someone yeah. who's in remission. I find that the, the pet can be overly sensitive, and you get what are called false positives. Mm -hmm. So the pet finds things that are nothing or no big deal, but then it leads you on a wild goose chase. And patients get nervous. Um, so for that reason, I'm more like Stephanie, and I more rely on CT scans for surveillance than I do for PET scans. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right, one last, and then we have to move on, or we're about five minutes late. OK. Um, my question is, I, I, had, I was diagnosed with diffuse large B cell first, and so then I went, I went through our CHOP, and then three years later, I got a second opinion. I, I was diagnosed with follicular and found out that I always had it. So currently I'm in watch and wait. My dilemma is this. Every time I go to a doctor for anything, I can sneeze and somebody wants to do a CT scan on me. <laughs> if I have a pain in my side, I automatically, because I'm a cancer patient, I, everybody wants to do CT scans. What advice do you give people like me to hold off when we're in, when we're in emergency rooms or in doctor's office, when somebody is telling us we need yet another one. And I, I don't know how to, how to address it. This is really difficult. <laughs> <laughs> um, w when you have a cancer patient with a new symptom, of course you're gonna worry that the cancer is the cause of the symptom. So you're not alone. There's a lot of people that go through this. Um, one thing you can do, which I recommend to folks, is to try to let time sort it out for you. And that can reduce the number of needless tests. So you have a new pain. Well, we all get new pains from time to time. 
and if it, the pain is because you were moving your sofa around <laughs> two days ago, that will go away, you know, in a week or 10 days or t something. And pain from cancer doesn't do that. It will just get worse over time. It's not a totally satisfying answer, but I find that's the best way to try to eliminate a lot of needless tests. Just take a little time and try to let time sort it out for you as to whether you need to go on to some fan formal testing. And the decision also could be shared by your oncologist. I mean, he may understand that this is obviously not a symptom of your cancer and may say, don't get the CAT scan. Obviously, if you're in an emergency room, you can't do that. But um, So I hope that helps a little bit. I'm going to have to end our panel discussion. Thank you very much to our uh, panel. I'd, so we, we heard about front line. treatment of follicular.